I have a microphone. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for uh, coming along to attend this uh, this talk. I'm going to give you a um, a bit of an overview of the work we do with Uni Green Scheme. Um, um, that's particularly focused on universities, um, but we also work a lot with um, a, a wide range of public sector organisations, uh, the MRC, BBSRC, as well as a lot of private sector labs. Um, so, the talk is going to be looking at second-hand equipment, uh, as in stuff that you might have in your labs what you can do with it, whether you can sell it, and um, the impact of that, and also um, what options you might have for, for buying um, second-hand equipment and saving a little bit of money. So I'm going to start with the problem that we face um, in universities. So the, the Uni Green Scheme started when I was studying as a student in Birmingham a, a few years back, um, and what I saw uh, in lots of different labs was rooms uh, full of equipment like this that was sat on benches in in cupboards and things like that, sat there uh, just depreciating value. Nobody knows why it's there, whether it works or not. And quite often, a lot of this equipment would just get pulled out during a clear out, thrown in electrical, waste skip, and that was the end of it. And so I was thinking, well, surely there's something we can do with this equipment that's better than just disposing of it. Um, so I started looking into what are the barriers to reusing second-hand equipment, uh, particularly within the environment of a university, because that was what I was looking into at the time. And uh, the first thing that came up is, is its issues with time. And you'll see this across um, kind of any um, reuse um, sector, anything to do with sustainability. If, if reusing items is a hassle or it takes a lot of time, then it just doesn't happen, uh, except for maybe a very few kind of committed people. And in universities, for sure, dealing with surplus items was like way down on the list of priorities for for staff you know they had to run the facilities and keep things uh, ticking over on a day-to-day -day basis um, so the first barrier is if they wanted a more sustainable way to dispose of equipment uh, they needed to do it in a very kind of time efficient manner it had to be quick and easy um, that was the first barrier the second is space university labs they never have um, or they very rarely have space to store equipment so there were a number of models out there that exist to try and reuse items, but a lot of them involve kind of holding on to the item for a long period of time. And sometimes, you know, the moment that they realize they've got something they don't need is because they bought something new and they need it gone within the next 48 hours. Um, so um, space is another barrier to reuse. And the other one is risk. There's a lot of concerns over what happens if we pass on um, secondhand equipment you know what's what's the issue for us what's the liability what's the concerns what you know what's the worst case scenario that can come out of uh, this um, this situation so we came up with a service that was a resale service for universities and we would offer them basically this free service where we'd come and uh, collect their equipment we would take it to our facility and we would sell it from there acting as a, as a dealer um, so the first thing is by being by collecting items um, you basically eliminate all the um, time and hassle issues that staff would have with other kind of uh, routes um, by storing items. I mean, lab equipment doesn't sell quickly. You might have to put it into storage for like a year potentially in some items for it to for it to find a new home. Uh, by storing it in our facility, we can do that. And then once it's sold, we return a, a share of the profits back. So university facilities, rather than having um, you know, rather than having um, storerooms full of equipment like this, basically they get a they get a clear out. And, um, and they potentially get some money back. So that was the premise of the service. And it wasn't just small items either. We, did, we started growing um, you know, since, since we started with the early models where it was microscopes. The scale of what we're doing has, has increased dramatically. And rather than getting small little instruments, you know, we're doing a um, big piece of kit. This was one instrument in Bristol. Um, and literally, the, the unit had been brought across a, a sky bridge and installed into a lab. It weighed one ton, it's a seven Tesla magnet, and they lost all the paperwork for how it was originally transported over the bridge. Um, so they were, they were like, how are we gonna get rid of it? We came in, we, our team used the gantry crane to lower it onto a pallet, we paid a surveyor to assess the bridge, we built the bridge reinforcements, and then we brought it across the bridge uh, and removed the reinforcements, then took it down the lift, down to the loading bay and out onto a truck, all zero cost to the university. So before they even think of oh wait, we might get some money back for this. They're actually just going, you know, we just saved like four or five thousand pounds plus all the hassle of organizing all that. And so that's what we found is it's the, the money driver um, is important to a lot of labs, but it's also just not having to deal with the problem in many cases. Um, this, was, uh, this is some data from University of Birmingham. 
um, which has been one of our longest uh, longest clients. And uh, so far, we've we've uh, collected and sold over 77 tons of equipment. So that's like a huge amount of equipment that would have gone into electrical waste um, if it wasn't for being able for us to collect and, and sell it. Uh, this is a good example. This is from an electronic engineering lab. Uh, they bought 200 new oscilloscopes, uh, digital versions for their teaching lab. They had all these analog ones that worked perfectly, but they just took a bit more space. So we were able to sell them to schools and um, small like, like hobbyists and research companies as well. Um, and they got about £3,000 from that project. Uh, it might have been a bit more than that, actually, but you know, this would have been a hazardous waste CRT waste disposal problem. Suddenly, it's like it's 200 instruments having a second life in other kind of settings. Uh, and that's the sort of thing we get, you know, it's really kind of exciting here. Um, so this is uh, uh, University of East Anglia. Um, we're based in South Wales, right? So Birmingham, Bristol, locally quite easy for us to serve. Uh, East Anglia, obviously, it's quite a bit further. So we use a slightly different model there. So our team normally turn up on site and collect equipment, remove everything. Here, the team, um, basically, they they would round up equipment into a room and then we'd come and collect it on a, on a more sporadic basis. But we were still able to prevent over three tons of waste. I think that was in sort of half a year. Um, so, you know, the numbers are increased um, considerably as the, as the project has grown. This is, uh, this is kind of our nationwide impact so far. And you can see these are our clients across the UK. So um, my colleague Anard's there uh, who uh, runs out. We've got a new site up in Dumfries in Scotland and we're serving um, the Scottish region a little bit further now. But you can see most of our client base is kind of in the Midlands. We do a bit of Cambridge and, and London, but the nationwide impact has been, has been uh, quite substantial now. It's over 500 collections, 10,000 pieces of equipment that haven't gone into waste disposal, that have gone into reuse just by using a, a more sustainable kind of uh, um, uh, approach and 170 tons of waste that have been prevented through the service. So that's kind of like a little bit on what you know what we do, uh, how it works, and as I said, most of it's on. Most of that has been focused on universities. I wanted to kind of go on to the other side of things now. How do we sell equipment? Where does it go? Uh, what sort of stuff might have value? Um, so, you know, briefly speaking, there's kind of three. If you were looking to sell your equipment, you know, there's kind of three areas you can do that. One is you can go to dealers, and there are you know there are a number of dealers out there who will offer you prices on kit, and we we use that model because we sell a huge range of equipment. You know we don't sell everything to end users, um, we sell some equipment to dealers, so you can go to them and you can get a price. Uh, of course, their price is going to necessarily be less than you might get if you went to an end an end user, but it's still an easy way to sell sell surplus equipment. Um, there's also general markets, so you can put products on things like eBay. Um, but uh, you know, there's there's challenges there, particularly from a university side of things. If you went to procurement and said, "I want to sell a microscope on eBay," uh, you know, that's not gonna it's not gonna happen realistically. Um, and there's lab specific markets as well. So we, you know, we sell on some of these. Um, we also sell on our own shop, but we use a number of different avenues to try and get surplus equipment back into reuse um, rather than disposal. Th these are the these are the top ten kind of categories that we find are most suitable for reuse um, and resale. So microscopes, I mean, microscopes in kind of any condition, there will be somebody out there who wants it, you know, whether they're, whether they're going to, whether they're going to refurbish it, whether they're going to put new optics in it or new lamps or whatever, um, you know, don't throw microscopes away because there is an option, you know, there will be options out there. Uh, incubators as well, there's um, incub incubators, analytical equipment, um, form a big part of our our kind of sales but it's generally stuff like little water baths and hot plates and stirrers and if you go over to the sustainable laboratory stand we've provided all the um, benching and the lab furniture uh, it's all stuff like that that is very easily redeployable um, you know you can take it out of one lab and put it into another without having to invest a significant amount of cost that's the sort of stuff that you know you you would be able to reuse um, and or or resell really um, you know vacuum pumps and microscopes this is a little bit about where the equipment we sell kind of goes. So 70, I think it's 73% of what we sell stays within the UK. So it's lots of research companies here. Um, you know, sell a bit to North America, um, 
quite a lot of Europe, but Africa, Australia. There's, there's markets globally for lab equipment, for sure. And if you start having conversations with people internationally, you know, they say, well, we're desperate for this stuff. You know, we don't have the money to buy new. Uh, and they jump up and down the thought of getting some secondhand lab equipment. So I'm going to just present a little bit of data now on why why reuse is so important, um, kind of versus just general um, recycling of instruments. So that we did a bit of work again with Bristol here. There was a student, um, Nick Rothwell, who was doing, he did a, a master's study looking at equipment reuse, and he did some carbon footprinting work. And what he he did is he came to our facility and took a large number of instruments that we had, um, top ten categories. He broke them down and looked at their material composition. Uh, and from that, he was able to look at um, how much um, um, kind of carbon equivalent is in each in the average the average piece of laboratory equipment, um, and then looked at energy use from us and also new manufacturers. And what he found was effectively reusing equipment, as in taking a, an instrument like a microscope and just reusing it again, thus avoiding a new piece, a new equipment manufacturer, is forty percent, forty four percent better by emissions than just recycling the products which makes sense you know if you rather than just crushing the microscope for materials and then trying to make a new one you know if you can just go from a to b and keep that item being reused time and time again um that's that's the best solution it saves a lot of resources and those numbers were calculated um on generic lab equipment i mean we sell instruments like this this was out of the university of oxford uh thin film deposition chamber and you can imagine the amount of like carbon resources and other resources that were invested in a product like that. This study would have only captured the basics. So, you know, if you can get a machine of like that reused again rather than being manufactured from fresh, the impact is just, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't calculate without doing a case by case basis. So I want to look at why resale is important just to just to kind of round off um, and why we do why we use this approach of selling equipment It's because People who have things, you know, they don't, um, particularly in universities, you know, there's no incentive to get rid of it. So if they've got something in the cupboard, why would they get rid of something uh, if they could keep it? Um, you know, that's why you find academics have got backups of backups of backups of backups because they don't want to get rid of their old equipment. If you can offer a resale service to somebody, you might not be able to get them to get rid of their backups, but they might start looking at their third, fourth generation bits of kit. And rather than just having it sat there, in a cupboard depreciating for years and years and years, you can maybe persuade them to let go of a couple of instruments and get them back into the market and, and reused again. And resale has that impact. It's, you know, we've been to departments where, you know, the staff are sort of angry that we're taking equipment away until they find out that it's not being crushed, it's going somewhere good, and they might get some money back. And all of a sudden, they're emptying their cupboards, not like rounding all the equipment up. Uh, and so particularly in larger organizations, you know, offering resale as a service can really help uh, increase um, sustainability across the, across the whole department. So I hope that's, that's basically a brief kind of overview of what we do and, uh, and the impact uh, that it's had um, in the sector since we started. So if anyone wants to ask any, uh, any, any questions, there's also a, a leaflet stand if you want any more information um, right there. Mm? A little bit of both. So um, the information that you get from the department is like so invaluable. Um, a lot of our kind of uh, similar models in the market that are doing this kind of thing, what they might do is they might try and get items like once they've been disposed of through recovery of, you know, you try and recover a microscope once it's in a skip. But it's so much harder then to understand, you know, what the condition of that unit was before it was. If you can, what we do, what we've been very successful at doing is working directly with the lab techs who will say, you know, you don't want that one, it's rubbish, doesn't work properly. This one, great unit, really works really well. And so we use that information as part of our process of describing products for sale. Um, and then we would do a number of tests. So it's basic stuff, you know, water baths, testing the temperature it reaches. You know, you can't just say, oh, yeah, this, this is a water bath. Um, technical specifications is uh, 100, 100 degrees. Yeah, but it only goes up to like 68. <laughs> that doesn't mean there's that doesn't mean there's not somebody out there who'll use it at 68. It just means that we've got to actually diagnose what it is and whether it's suitable for for sale. So we do we do a lot of that, um, and also we rely a lot on the information of the sector. Like if you sell a product to a customer, 
um, uh, in many cases, particularly the more um, niche equipment, we would say, look, you know, we haven't got the resources to test this, this, this particular instrument, but we'll, we'll, we'll send it to you on a 90 day return basis. If you're happy with it, buy it from us. If not, send it back, we'll cover all the shipping, you know, and then they might say, you know, we tried it, but this critical component doesn't work properly. And then we've got information that helps us sell it in the future anyway. So everybody kind of wins. They get to try out products and we get, we get diagnostics. Um, yes, we do more than universities. So um, the reason universities, it's occurred that way is like I said, because I was studying when it all kind of started off, it's been universities that it's kind of grown out of. But like we're doing huge projects at the minute. We're working with um, um, uh, uh, Public Health England uh, in, in one of the new sites there. They're clearing out um, MRC. We're doing a, a project there. Um, we've done stuff with various research institutes. And then there's a huge number of private sector labs as well. But what I've found personally is that from a sustainability perspective, there's more of a problem in the, in the generic public sector because you've got large complex institutions with lots and lots of cupboards effectively you go to a very small research company they have a much better understanding of what they have and a much more financially orientated like they can make just make a decision if they want to sell something they can make it they can just sell it whereas if you go to a big university and you've got somebody who they just don't know what to do they don't know how you know, they have no idea where to go with something and so that's where lots of stuff is getting chucked away at the minute <coughs> Yeah. Do we? Yeah. Yeah, we sell. So we we issue we offer a forty five day, war, uh, like no quibble warranty on everything to the point that if somebody buys something, and they don't like the color, they can send it back. So that's like just good practice in the sale market. It's like you know these days you go to buy clothes, you know. You, you, you could always return them. It's the same with, with lab equipment. You know, if somebody doesn't like the product, they're not happy with it, it doesn't work well with their experiment, they could always um, send it back. But we've taken all the, all the categories of lab equipment and we've decided which ones, as a team, we can um, adequately ensure reach certain specifications. So there's, you know, balances. You know, you can, you can, we can easily um, put on calibrated balances on a balance and calibrate it and say, you know, this is a product that meets specifications, but say, in, um, you know, a, a, a sequencer running off software we don't have anymore, you know, isn't something we could offer anything more than just saying it powers on. Um, so that's the first thing we did is we split the, we split the market by the different categories. Um, so by, buyers generally, they, they, you know, we're very, very transparent. You know, nobody buys something from us thinking it's going to be perfect only to find it doesn't work they know it's either untested really or they know it works to spec and we've tested that okay. great okay well thank you thank you very much if you anyone has any further questions we'll be we'll be around for a little while and we've got some some uh, some leaflets so feel free to have a chat okay cheers